Hi, good afternoon, and welcome to CIO Leadership Live. I'm your host, Mary Fran Johnson, CEO of Mary Fran Johnson Media and a regular contributing editor and writer on CIO.com. Twice a month, we produce CIO Leadership Live with the generous support of my friends at CIO.com and in the CIO Executive Council. We're streaming live to you right now on LinkedIn and on our very special CIO channel on YouTube. And we welcome all of our viewers who are watching today to type in questions of your own if you would like to reach out to my guest, who, by the way, is here for a big milestone in the show. Today is number 100 in our lineup of Leadership Live shows, which we started back in 2018. So we will welcome next to our, our number, our 100th guest, John McCaffrey, who is the CIO of H2M Architects and Engineers based in Melville, New York, which is a little bit east of New York City. H2M provides architectural and engineering services to the entire tri-state area of New York, Connecticut, and New Jersey, which happens to be the largest and wealthiest metro area in the United States. H2M's 500 employees are delivering building design and environmental consulting services to public and private sector organizations. And that means everything from water and waste treatment facilities to firehouses and road reconstruction and community rebuilding projects. John joined H2M in 2019. He is one of those CIOs who keeps getting pulled back out of retirement and into active duty. And so he brought with him nearly four decades of IT leadership experience and broad technical depth and skill in public sector IT and finance. He spent seven years as the CIO of New York State's Westchester County, and before that served as CIO of Orange County, New York, also for seven years. Uh, he has also along the way founded his own consultancy, which is mostly focused on working with municipal governments and educational institutions. John, welcome. It's great to have you here today. Thank you, Mary Fran. Great to be here. Great to be number 100. <laughs> and uh, I, I appreciate the invitation and the opportunity to uh, to be on Leadership Live. Thanks so much. All right, all right, Grand. I want to start out and having have you tell us that when you look at your your long history in IT, all the leadership positions you've had, tell us what drew you to H two M, this privately held mid sized company full of engineers and architects, and we know how engineers are always full of their own ideas for for the technology people. Um, after so many years in public sector, CIO land, and even the captain of your own consulting ship, what, what was it about H2M that got you interested and, and dragged you once again back into full-time work? Yeah, so as you mentioned, I technically sort of retired twice, but the, after the, the second retirement, uh, I had a, a number of friends, my experience in the public sector, I dealt a lot with it with public sector projects and whatnot and and understanding the design and and building even even some aspects of building design and mm -hmm. public sector public sector and, and public safety facilities and whatnot um i had uh, a couple of associates who had come to work with with h2m one of them is a vp another one is our in our gis area and mm -hmm. within a half hour of, of each other they called and said we need an it guy that was their, that was their their statement but when I did the research and looked at uh, at H2M and and had had discussions with the folks here, understood mm -hmm. that they were in in need of real development in terms of technology. They had IT support, but were looking for to to take it to the next step. Uh -huh. And actually, I was brought on as the IT director, but with the discussion of the the need and the real business relationship yeah. of technology and and the use of technology and the the C suite, they understood that. And actually, mm -hmm. six months later, created the CIO position and, and moved me into the CIO position, mm -hmm. understanding the difference between IT director, if you will, and, and customer service, if you will, and, and really being a part of the business and yes. business development. Yes, because a lot of the CIOs that I talk with wouldn't even, especially when they have, you know, illustrious careers behind them or uh, lots of that kind of work experience, they wouldn't really consider going into a company where they might become the IT guy again, because it's such a strategic part of business. Did Was it much of an uphill climb for you to make them realize the strategic importance of technology or were they kind of sold when you got there? 
I, I think it was it was, it was a little it, it, it was even even coming on board I still a little bit of a you know a, a change in the mindset you know we talk mm -hmm. people process and technology but it's all people right everything falls but I think the process you know processes are the tougher thing to change tech is I won't say it's easy but it's easy and, and people are tough but in terms of um, the, the association so so it's really bringing that mindset for me of process would talk business process improvement and whatnot, but change is, is difficult. But to understand what was possible in, in this industry, there was an understanding there, but I think th th they were yearning to, to say, okay, how do, we, how do we make that happen? How do we go down this road to make, to make technology really, not just, again, the internal support, but make technology part of the development you know, of the business and future growth. We're grow we'll continue to grow as a firm yeah. And uh, and as in that sense, how do we continue to grow and make sure that we're at the top of our game in terms yeah. of and, and recognized as tech savvy? Yep. Well, and I also notice in your story about how they found found you and reached out to you, the power of the network that that you have and, and that most CIOs these days have all of those technology and business executive connections that lead to this sort of thing because you were not out in the market looking for another game not at all not at, yeah. not at all and that's exactly it. it's up you know it was, as i said somebody reached out turned out that another oh. person was looking they said the same thing and yeah. just the the other thing is jumping you know from the the larger environments to the mid-size like this mid-size environment you know for me after you know at that point 30 something years of being mm -hmm. in and whatnot i was looking at it as the industry is still is still growing and my intrigue yeah. has never died, and this was. I knew that there were there were uh, developments continuing and really growing developments in terms of tech for this industry. And so the intrigue, you know, from the time I started in this area when I was 19 years old to, mm -hmm. to now, I'm still intrigued. You know, the ability yeah. to, to look and say we can do, we can still do, do good things, and there's still things that need to be done. Never mind what can be done. Yes. Well, and um, let's talk a bit about the AEC industry, architecture, engineering, and construction. That is a very big and huge, something like $10 trillion around the world. It's a very big industry, but it has never been known for being very advanced on the tech front, which I think, and I, I think you pointed that out to me too when we talked earlier. So uh, talk about where H2M fits in the AEC industry and um, just what your impressions of that have been so far. So we're, we're multidisciplined also some in terms of our, uh, the diversity of our, our various disciplines, if you will, not to repeat, but we have a uh, environmental division that, that does invest, that works as consultants, uh, investigations of water you know water sampling and, con and again it's on a consulting basis soil sampling at one time h2m had its own labs that they spun off but we're still looking at that we're we have an insurance division and a forensics division that looks and takes handles claims to determine why certain components may have failed then we have our structural and civil divisions that that focus mostly on uh, and survey mo focus mostly on uh infrastructure and whatnot in the public sector Water and wastewater division disciplines are again focused on water plants, water testing, making sure that uh, with what's called emerging contaminants in water, ensuring that water, you know, water delivery systems and water purification systems working. We also have a wastewater di discipline that again looking at wastewater and making sure that for purification and and I say distribution, but uh, handling of, of wastewater and and purifying, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have what you would consider the typical architectural and engineering uh, disciplines and architecture. We we have K through 12, we have municipal, we have higher ed, we have government areas. Um, but I think a large part of it, and, and one of the things that, that we found is coming in, it's not, it, with the, the, the industry is not known for technology. And one of the things that we've really focused on is the, you know, the old, not the the, the, the phrase data is the oil, but it's so the, the history of H2M, as a matter of fact, this is our 90th year, mm -hmm. um, 2023 is our 90th year, and the history and, and the project, the, the varied projects from those disciplines that, that H2M has worked on, the data is voluminous, but we weren't really utilizing the data. So, you know, one of the things that's typical for any industry and what we've done, right, and the tools now are there for mm -hmm. analytics is we, we have disparate systems that serve purposes for each of their individual functions, but nobody we really look to pull those together. And we've worked 
hard to pull those together mm -hmm. to make sure we're in, uh, eliminating redundancy, du duplication of effort and whatnot, but also now digging deeper and look, digging deeper and looking at trend analysis of the data that we have. So mm -hmm. we may utilize that data in a way that wasn't where we look and say, uh, we always know about the, the projects or the proposals that we've won and we're doing the job, but what about proposals that we've lost? So for instance, I use that as an example all the time to look and say, let's use all of this data that we got on proposals and perhaps maybe we're able to look and say, why are we not getting K through 12 business on the east end of Long Island or something like that? We weren't, in, in essence, the company was not even looking at that, if you will. You know, that they, they, they were looking at it individually, but we're now with the tools that exist, right? Just simply, they're less expensive and whatnot. And we're able to do that analysis and do trend analysis and finding, finding you know, gems in the, in, that we weren't even looking for. You know, yeah. so that's that's a, a focus. Um, where, where the industry has really advanced, to just expand on that, building information modeling, 3D design, uh, reality capture using drones and scanners, and bringing that all together. And now, from our standpoint, not just looking at it as design of a, of a building or design of a bridge, if you will, or whatever infrastructure, but actually pulling that all together and looking at the entire life cycle of infrastructure or building where, um, from building information modeling standpoint, we're able to do reality capture of a facility as it exists and look at redesign or yeah. do reality capture it tied with GIS and bring those pieces together to look at a piece of land where the design work is going to be done. Interesting. And yeah. and now expanding, and people don't even realize that this is a thing, if you will, but 4D, 5D, 6D, 7D, 3D design is as it sounds. 4D is now incorporating with that 3D uh, design, looking at the timeline of mm -hmm. a project, of development project. 5D mm -hmm. is actually incorporating budget into that. So again, it's using all that data Six, uh, 60 and 70 are looking at sustainability and facilities management. Yeah. And while we look at all of this information that we're able to pull together and we're able to create data products that are provided while well, we're not in construction, but obviously providing to the contractors, but mm -hmm. also being able to provide that design work and completion work and reality capture all of that to an owner or, or a developer for their use in terms of ongoing facilities management of their yeah. facility or of their structure. Well, you had mentioned when we talked earlier that the area that you're seeing your greatest growth as a company is from the utilities. In fact, you're working with a very large Norwegian firm right now and creating, helping them create and design their headquarters on Long Island in wind power. So it's just, does this, um, how, how ably are the technologies you have right now operating at H2M, how how able are they to keep up with these more advanced design and technology demands from customers that you win? So, so that when you look at wind power, obviously this is a growing thing. There, there's a, a major project off of Long Island. We also recently, uh, in the last year, opened an office in Florida with the same mm -hmm. uh, idea in mind. We have some partners down there that we work with. Wind power is a, a big consideration off the shore, you know, off the coast. And the uh, we were able to because because of our capabilities and because of our work, uh, we also have an energy division uh, that that works closely with utilities in terms of facilities design. In terms of uh, I'm going to look at it in terms of, and I'm I'm not speak I'm speaking out of turn because I'm not an engineer, right? But looking in terms of laying cable and running cable and and how mm -hmm. it, not only the construction we do uh, water towers and whatnot, but same thing. In terms of construction, looking at construction from the foundation under under the ocean, if you will, right to the to the yeah. to building structures that extend out of the ocean, and obviously wind turbines. So working with uh, this Norwegian firm, they mm -hmm. asked us about that, knowing we had an energy division, but also enlisted us to build their their North American headquarters here on Long Island, or design yeah. it, I should say, not build it. But uh, but we're because of our um, our involvement in the utilities and energy uh we have a mechanical electrical and and uh plumbing division mep that that handles hvac systems and all that within facilities and tying all those and, and really it does bring many of our disciplines together in terms of that kind of work mm -hmm. uh we're, we're very capable of looking at it and saying okay 
we're, we're still learning, right, in terms of wind power, a lot of places are still learning, but we understand the structural aspects. We understand the energy aspects. We understand mm -hmm. power plants and design of power plants. So the actual, you know, wind turbines, if you will, aren't our, in our wheelhouse, but working together. And that's yeah. true of many of the firms that we deal with that mm -hmm. we're, we're learning as well as, as a company about those things, but also bringing our expertise. Uh, another area is we've, um, and I, I, I know you've seen it, that we've just built the largest 3D home, 3D yes. printed home on Long Island, um, which is, is not necessarily new, but we've built it and we've working with our understanding of uh, with uh, regulations and laws and zoning requirements, we, which we mm -hmm. work very closely with municipal governments and whatnot, what, yeah. what the requirements are, we were able to, H2M was able to provide, uh, work with a construction firm to build a 3D home here on Long Island. And uh, it's very interesting, very, and again, those, those are the types of things that have kept me intrigued because yeah. this is new technology. And mm -hmm. again, with our expertise as a company, and and working as a technology savvy company looking and saying 3d printing somebody thinks about oh you're going to 3d print a house but it actually goes through and it layers concrete just like a 3d printer would build any other uh you know, structure or model this yeah. is a very large 3d printer the design mm -hmm. we're doing the design work working with the construction firm and they're layering it's a it's layering of concrete to build an actual structure that yeah. meets all of the uh, zoning requirements and construction requirements of uh, of any government, if you will. Well, I noticed there was a, a little blurb on your website about it, um, dated just, I think, it, last week, that H2M was producing, this was the first 3D printed senior housing complex in the United States, and that it's a two-story tall plus basement structure the first 3D printed apartment building, Correct. the very yes. first. So, All right. Yeah. So, the, and again, that's that's so hard to imagine uh, that. That's so. that's our goal, and you know, mm -hmm. one of one of the things also that that brought me to H2M, but is intrigue, you know, it's part of the intrigue as well, is that as we're midsize, we've got we've got 140 plus architects, we've got over 200 engineers mm -hmm. in different disciplines, yeah. and whatnot. Um, looking at is with the multidiscipline uh, factor but also that we're agile we were able to you know we're some of the bigger firms you know mm -hmm. the fact that we've done that and we've moved into that, uh, that arena is 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 huge right it makes a statement but it's also because we are we've maintained agility in design not just the tech area but in design and in construction the field yep. not that we're in construction but looking at it we've maintained that agility as a midsize you know, mm -hmm. we ha we can turn and we've been able to it, even as I talked about with data integration or analytics or BIM building information modeling, 3D design mm -hmm. work, uh, for looking at data product and saying we we have not yet, but looking at and saying we'll be able to to sell data product for, facil for mm -hmm. facilities management is we can make we've made that turn in a short period of time. Yeah. And I think some of the larger firms, they're they're definitely on that on that spectrum. But sometimes making that turn, they can't make it as quickly as we do. So I, yeah. it's very, that's one of the things that's been very intriguing to me, even as I said, a mid sized firm to be considered and saying, oh, work with this company to build a 3D home yeah. or build a 3D apartment complex. Wow. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's, it's intense. <laughs> for yeah. lack of well, pro probably intense and exciting in both good and it's bad exciting, ways, yes. right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, have you found, are there common problems that, you have either solved or in the process of solving that you hear about from some of your other CIO and, and IT leadership peers in this AEC area, and maybe in the mid-sized mid company realm where it's design rather than the actual construction of it, um, the design and planning aspects. Um, what, are the, what are the common problems? Is everybody trying to solve the enterprise data scramble or uh, tell us about that? So I, I think that, you know, there's a couple areas that come to mind with that. I think the enterprise data is is absolutely one, especially mm -hmm. if you look at firms like ours, regardless of size, that are multidisciplinary and trying to pull the pull together all of that so that any particular project that involves uh, multiple disciplines, whether it's two or, or six or seven, uh, pulling that data together and being able to, to collaborate and then as well working with 
contractors using, and it's like like many other fields, but using very different tools. Some of them uh, varied tools that are AEC focused, but trying another a contractor or an owner is is using a facilities management tool, or the contractor is using a project management tool that's different from the project management tool that H2M is using, and that data exchange. Is really it's been it's been happening, but it's really coming into play now and coming into the fold and mm-hmm. and co- coordinating that data. And it seems in the industry that's that is one of the uh, the areas of, of major focus again is that the utilizing data, but also the the transfer of data and and pulling together disparate systems because yeah. it's not it's there's a there's a certain part of it is back and forth with the contractor. We've done the design work. They'll someone submits an RFI request for information in the midst of construction, so it requires a quick turnaround. Or they provide submittals to say this is this is the work that's been completed. Yeah, there's a lot of exchange of data going on, and and like many other industries, it could be retail, right? But in here, it's mm-hmm. it needs construction. You need you need answers to those questions quickly, and I think that's the the data exchange is a is a big thing. Yeah. I think the other thing is virtual reality and augmented reality is something that a lot of the firms are, we're all moving into, it's a little bit of a struggle regardless, again, regardless of size, I think it's the industry. I think there's there's a certain piece where even for 3D is in some sense, you're selling a client on the value of 3D. I think the contractors pretty much know, but they're looking at it and saying they're used to 2D for plans, mm-hmm. plans, and specifications out their and whatnot. Right? Yeah. Exactly. To, well, to some extent, right? But whether electronic or not, or digital or yeah. not. But but looking at 3D and saying this is the value of 3D, and and in the end, you'll have something that will show not only your structure in 3D, but you'll actually be able to use it and look at all of your HVAC systems, your your electrical systems, your plumbing mm-hmm. systems, tying to the infrastructure externally as well as the roadways and curb cuts and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but the using virtual reality now and augmented reality in terms of uh, the ability to deliver. So very often we we will do renderings and whatnot, and that'll give you the almost sort of the animated view of okay, this is what your project will look like. So yeah. we you know the, there's always there's always the drawings, the color drawings, but now you have renderings that sort of let you walk. Now we're we're actually at that at the forefront, and I think. No, we're not at the forefront. I think this is across the industry. This is one of the things we're is taking and saying, okay, we're going to present this 3D. We're going to show you what your building would look like, and you're going to put on your Oculus 3D or other 3D glasses, and you're yeah. going to walk. You're going to stand in your empty structure, and walk through, and see the desks, and see the walls, and see the doors, and and all of that, and you're able to actually walk through. Or you're going to say. Uh, you're going to take the structures not built at all yet, you know, in right. terms of it's not a renovation, and look at it and say, okay, I'm going to, I'm literally going to walk in from Main Street. I'm going to walk in the front door. I'm going to walk yeah. to the elevator. I'm going to take the elevator up. I'll be able to move this chair, open this door, and whatnot. And that's a, that's a push for a lot of firms to say mm-hmm. we're going to, uh, for lack of better, I'm going to say this is a, you know, this is a, a free ad, if you will. We're going to give this to you because mm-hmm. we know that. We know that when we do, the next time you're coming back, you're going to want it. And we're seeing sure. now, we're, and, and again, this is industry-wide, now we're seeing more RFPs that are requiring, that are looking okay. and saying, we, yeah. need, we need 3D design. We want to see, we want you to be able to do the rendering and provide us with, with the virtual reality or the augmented reality. And that's, again, it's those things aren't new, but for the industry, there's, we're seeing more of a pull and saying yeah. we want this. This right. is we want we want uh, level four hundred design, if you will. Well, and we want to yeah. see we want to see we don't want to just see a rendering anymore. We want to be able to walk. We want to be able to do that yes. virtual walk. Yeah. Well, and just that ability to visualize and walk through that taps into so many more just parts of our brains when we're considering things. The visualization. Um, and I always think of that um, a favorite phrase among marketers, where you show a client something they never knew they always wanted, and yeah, you've got a way to true. deliver it. And um, we true. have we have a wonderful question for you. It's from one of our alert watchers right now, coming in from YouTube on our CIO channel. And uh, this person says, I totally identify my professional experience to John's as IT responsible for working on a BIM, a building information management suite project integration. He says, it was a hell of a project. 
And here's the question. How mature is BIM technology considered right now, please? Would love to hear what you think about that. How mature is it? So I think yeah. it's interesting because I think it's, it, it, I don't think, it's still evolving uh, to, to a great extent. Uh, and, and I think there's, mm -hmm. if you look at it from the standpoint, here, here's, I'll, I'll give you a, I'll give you a statement from our own, our own company. When I came in the door using Revit, which is the 3d product from Autodesk yes. mm -hmm. using Revit was, it, it was here, everybody had access to it. And there was a, and I didn't even realize it until I was here for a little bit, a little while, but there was a, a policy that every project that we do would be done in Revit. Yeah, it was a mandate, and, right? Uh, and everybody uh, yes, was yes. pretty much and, ignoring and, it. <laughs> and and and, uh, and unless you unless you could justify the reason to not use Revit, mm -hmm. um, then then every project would be done. But mm -hmm. to your point, it was somewhat being ignored. One of the uh, you know one of the um, I'll say I don't want to I don't want to go subject anybody to ageism, right? But somebody who was sort of in the middle was looking at it and saying, "Well, look, when I came in, I was still doing it on pencil with pencil and paper, mm -hmm. and I never wanted to do use AutoCAD." Yeah. Uh, so, so he said, "So for the, those folks who are using AutoCAD, they don't really want to think about Revit, but we also we also took that and transformed." Uh, so I, I know I'm getting a little bit away from the question, but I think it comes back. I'll come back to the answer, but uh, okay. it, it also transformed that a lot of our a lot of the younger uh, folks coming out of school were familiar with Revit and were actually over designing. They were using Revit when we were, we, when we just needed simple things for presentation. Revit is such a such a uh, great tool that they were. And again, I'm, I'm not architect yeah. or engineer, but they were able to they were they were basically going, oh, we'll make it look like this. We'll make it. And we didn't need that point. So it required it required a reeducation, if you will, to the H2M yeah. way. And the, so coming back to the question, I think I think it's at a great level of maturity, but I still think it's it's I don't want to say misused, but in a, in a sense misunderstood. And and yeah. really, H two M ourselves, we took a step back and we said, look, we're we're going to reeducate in the in the use of Revit, and we're going to make sure because again, uh, the maturity is there. We're seeing RFPs that require it, which is a big thing. We you can't afford to be behind be behind the eight ball. The tools are fantastic. There are more. There are more. For lack mm -hmm. of better, add-ons, add-ons to those tools, the ability to work with, uh, as I said, using the augmented reality or virtual reality right. and tying it to 3D that you really, you could, but you wouldn't necessarily be doing it with with 2D in the same way. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, it's, I think it's very mature. I just don't think, in terms of use, if you will, that it's as mature it's, as it's, it needs to be and will be. You know, even three years, five years is going to be more, it's much changed. more change management aspect, isn't it, John? Yeah, it, yeah it's exactly. The human resistance to change. Exactly. The idea that if what you have in your hand is a hammer, everything oh. you see is a nail. Is a nail, right, right. So right. this right. is what worked sure. for me. What do you mean you're going to take my hammer away from me? You know, exactly. I mean, that's, right. that's just such a, but you know, that was probably one of the, one of the things you could see so clearly coming in with all your experience as a CIO, uh, change change management is a core skill for any decent CIO. I think we would probably both agree. Um, and it sounds like from the beginning at H2M, you've had a lot of support from the CEO and the other C-suite leaders who wanted to get on your side and kind of move some of this change along. Yeah, absolutely. And I think one of the, um, you know, one of the things that I've has been my my mantra for for many years is mm -hmm. you know is to move away. I think I mentioned it earlier, but move away from the customer service and become partners. And that's internally and externally using you, with technology. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the beauties for for the various uh, positions I've been in over the years is when I came into H two M, IT from it, the standpoint of the support group was highly regarded. You know, it was, it was yeah, because to me. Yeah, that's unusual, isn't it? it? it You'd it, think coming extent, into a smaller company that the IT department would feel kind of beat up. But no. So to some, to some extent, you know, each each location, each position I was in, it seemed as if I was walking into the most part, even where even where areas were regarded well, that, that IT was the necessary evil. And I yeah. will say that walk, walking into H2M, that wasn't the case. Uh, you know, the, the couple of people on staff were, had been here for 20 plus years. They were, uh, again, very highly regarded and built a great foundation here in terms mm -hmm. of support and whatnot. But as you said, the, the, the entire C-suite um, and, and 
I would say virtually all of our discipline leads uh, were looking at it from the standpoint of we need we need to look at the business aspect yeah. of technology and yeah. and not just not just is my laptop running is my you know is the ERP system staying up and and whatnot right and then of course the other aspects uh, we've done a great job just in terms of the the buy-in you know looking at it and developing we're working on it but developing a disaster recovery plan and business continuity mm -hmm. the buy-in here has been outstanding for me you know looking at saying uh you know it's yeah. it's not it's not something that i've that i've had ease with in some of the other locations to say <laughs> what do you do and yeah. you know, what do you do if this building's gone right and it's easy to say right. send everybody home these days we know that yeah. from the pandemic right we can send right. everybody home we know that but what do you do if the building's gone what if you do if these servers ha and and in terms of our building out of uh re you know redundancy and whatnot I, mm -hmm. it's been the, the support has been tremendous and the, well, the I support remember I remember you told me about your CEO was your biggest supporter when, as news started trickling out in the earlier days of the pandemic, because you had joined in 2019, you'd worked with them in 2018 as a consulting CIO. So, um, it, but the CEO was the one who said, yes, everybody's going to work from home and take their laptops. And he was a big supporter of your Absolutely. Team. Yeah. As I, I basically came in and I, when we, when we heard things unfolding, as you said, I put mm -hmm. out a message to the entire staff said if, if you have an h2m laptop you need mm -hmm. to you know you should you should take this home and 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 test and make sure that you can connect and make sure let us know yeah. what the situation is and the ceo responded uh within a day and said no we're not gonna we're not gonna you should on saturday at 1 p.m we're all going home taking our laptops home and going and connecting and we're gonna we're gonna test the system you know we're gonna stress put the stress yeah. on the system and make sure that everything we've built is is really going to work yeah. so and 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 that's that that's just that's a one example and as i said for everything that we've looked at and the the directions we're trying to go the support from the c-suite you know really mm -hmm. is is tremendous well um give me a let's drill in a little bit to your technology and your biggest technology and business strategic concerns right now as you're going as we're all launched into 2023 what are some of the things i know you already mentioned data and the data integration issues but what are some of the the big projects ahead in terms of the technology and where do you have the most work still to do so i'll take the last part of it first and just say the most work in my mind really mm -hmm. is the or the or the 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 most laborious, if you work, is the data integration and the and the mm -hmm. analytics. That's where the biggest. Uh, but I think the you know for us some of the bigger things that we're looking at in making the you know letting let, you know letting letting engineers and architects and administrators administrative people be more effective is we're going down. We have a pilot for for uh, bots programs basically. We're mm -hmm. focused right now on administration so that all the calls that come in about your about uh, accounting or marketing or mm -hmm. HR, those types of things will be you know, those most common questions. We're, we have that pilot now that they'll you'll be able to, you know, those questions can be answered for you through the bot instead of calling and taking your time and taking and making sure you get somebody in HR. Mm -hmm. It's answered for you or the reference to actually take somebody and say, OK, we're going to. If we, we can't answer that question. We'll take it to HR or here, call, contact this person or something like that. Um, and RPA. So looking at um, the digital process automation and robotic process automation, we've uh, we're just at the tip of the iceberg with it, but we see a tremendous potential now with with RPA. Uh, you know, it, it seems like invoicing is is a great place to start. So it is, and that's the thing. But but <laughs> yeah. we're looking at in terms of those RFIs and submittals that it's very repetitive process. Uh, the beauty of RPA, you know, as if you develop it well, and we know this, it takes a lot of effort up front. But if you, the beauty is that regardless of the contractor, regardless of what that secondary software is that somebody else is using, that that information coming in can be processed and recognized. And does require and th that may be assisted and assisted or uh, process or maybe unassisted, unattended, attended or unattended. But looking at it and actually looking at these things that come in, picking it up and saying, okay, this is regardless of how it comes in, whether it's an email or whether it comes in through their system, whatnot. That that picking this up, oh, this is this project. This is a require. This is a request for 
uh, civil or structural and routes it accordingly to civil or structural as opposed to an administrative system doing it. And that's that's for us in a sense, that's much there's much more volume of that than there are invoices or that type of thing. So right. invoices is an easy place to start with it. But yeah. we look at that as that's going to be we're going to venture down that road. We're also looking at it as um, that with an attended uh, process, we'll be able to we have a tremendous amount of data. One poss- one project we're looking at a tremendous amount of data that's uh, legacy data that has not been archived and is mm-hmm. causing us some performance issues in our project management software. Now we look at it and say, well, we have a person who could go through these and look and say, this project's closed. This is the appropriate information. The data needs to be moved to the archive. And we found, and we're, and again, we're just at the tip of the iceberg here investigating, mm-hmm. but we're pretty sure we're going to be able to, we're talking thousands of projects. Um, yeah. Probably close to 20,000 projects of legacy data that we believe that we're going to be able yeah. to build an attended, at least attended, it may be unattended process to be able to move that data, recategorize it and, and log it within our project management system, as yeah. opposed to what's being done now as, as projects are closed. Well, so that's a yeah. that's a big project for us going forward. Yeah, well, and I was thinking about all these big projects and those couple hundred of engineers and architects and all their demands. You don't have a huge IT staff. You came in with pretty much, what, five or six people. You have a handful of people there. Talk about the size and scope of your IT team today and what you have done to either change or to redirect them into different areas uh, or maybe to bring in more outside help. So it's a, it is a little bit of both, but again, yeah, I, I came in, we had, uh, as I said, we had two people who had built a tremendous foundation uh, mm-hmm. over, over a 20 year period and stayed and stayed with the times. Um, but, right. but we, you know, there was absolutely a need, especially we are, as I said earlier, we are a growing firm. We continue to grow. We have projected growth again this year uh, of, I think, upwards of 10% in terms of revenue and, uh, and staff. And, um, so the the need was clear pretty pretty much early on. Um, we I think we spoke about it just briefly earlier, but so I'm I'm wearing the suit and tie today. But there were there are times where and and I actually somewhat enjoy it. But there have been times where I've been crawled crawling under a desk to to do an install or solve a problem. It's rare, but but it has happened. Um, but so again, having a small staff. It, they, it's also a matter of jacks of all trades, if you will, right? So we, right. Uh, yep. jacks and jills of all trades. Mm-hmm. So we've, um, we had, I had a staff of four when I came on, uh, now have a staff of nine. We have seven, eight, nine, we have nine uh, locations currently and, and growing. As I said, we just recently, uh, within the last year, added a Florida office. Mm-hmm. Um, so we required, you know, we, again, we, even there for remote support is, is great, but we still have a, I still have two staff that are sort of we call them the the journey people, if you will, that that are mm-hmm. going to those remote offices. Although we support from wherever, and the staff again, like like I said, with jacks of all trades, we've we've been focused a little bit more where we've been able to create a couple of positions that are focused mostly on desktop support and mm-hmm. and installation and desktop software off the office side of things and and some of the pro- predominant applications. Uh, my I have one person who is really, we have third party software and third party uh, managed services for security services. Yes. We have some, we've done some great, added some great tools and, and third party services. I have one person who is sort of split between infrastructure. He was, again, he did it, he did it all, but he's been more focused on, on infrastructure and security services for us. Uh, another person who is focused predominantly on, uh, on infrastructure servers and network. Uh, I have one between, but we really split between the the desktop support and whatnot. But we've again we've grown to. Uh, I have a staff of nine now, and we've grown yeah. to the the point of we're doing a little bit of segmentation. But again, we still pretty mm-hmm. much each covered it all, but trying to get more focus and mm-hmm. um, and, and going to that point also is in terms of you know retention is not easy these days, especially with you know the potential for. Um, Oh, I can work. I can do it. IT support, and I can work it from home. I can work remotely. I, I was wondering about that. That you know, and, when yeah, mm-hmm. yes, and and so even there, this last year, in the middle of the year, the CEO came, and this is the support. The CEO came and said, you know, we know what's going on. We've always sort of looked with HR. We've looked within the industry to see what 
you know, what people are, you know, for salaries and whatnot. But he, he came and basically said, look, we're going to look at IT because IT isn't just about AEC. These these men and women in IT could go out to any any they, industry. They sure boy. could. Yeah. And so they actually went out and it was at, at the CEO's behest. Basically, HR went out and did a broader scope and, and improved the salary, the salary structure oh, here good for them. as well. Good for them. And, yeah, because uh, money is not all of it at all, but it needs to exactly. be there. Ex yeah. yeah, yeah. So, and, and, and that's the thing. element. Yeah, it, exactly. And I think that's, you know, the other thing is, you know, that, that, you know, they spoke, spoken numerous times to me about is, is looking at it from the perspective is that I bring, uh, it's not just that understanding, it's not just the tech side, but it is the, mm -hmm. the mentoring side. It's having the discussions with uh, yes. a, a couple of very, you know, much younger people on my staff about the benefit of being in a small organization that you do get you know, you, mm -hmm. you, you might have gone you might have gone to school for, you know, you know, uh, IT or, or what have you, information technology or computer systems or what have you. But it being in this environment allows you to be that jack of all trades. And maybe sometime in your career, you you would say, oh, I really do love the network side of things. Or I really love it. Yep. Or yeah. or even to the point of understanding cloud and saying I'd like to be focused or I'd like to focus on security. Mm -hmm. And and so it, that's a big discussion for me in terms of, you know, moving from a very, very large staff, let's say in Westchester, you know, before yes. I came here to such a small staff, but saying the beauty of you being that's this is how I started in my first position. I was one mm -hmm. of six people managing a very large, uh, you know, IT systems for a municipality. Yeah. Uh, but I got to, but I got to understand all aspects. Yes. And that's the so and that's yeah. and that's one of the things that that I speak to my staff about to say you know you're you're getting a very broad range and that doesn't mean you can't focus and specialize in some kind mm -hmm. but this is this is a beauty of being in an organization like this so it's as you yeah. said it's not just about salary but that's mm -hmm. that's sort of my approach to retention as best like well and and i've always had the impression when i've talked to you previously john that that whole idea of servant leadership was very much core to how you have acted and throughout your career as a CIO, the idea that you're actually there to kind of help and lift up the rest of the organization as well. So, uh, yeah, I, I appreciate that because one of the things I remember, and again, having uh, larger staffs in, in various positions, but especially Westchester and Orange County is going in and saying, I'm not, I'm not, I'm, you, I'm not the smartest man in the room. I'm not the smartest person in the room. Mm -hmm. You folks all have your smarts and whatnot. I'm here to make sure that you can get the job done. I'm, mm -hmm. That's my yeah. job is to facilitate getting the job done. Yes, right. here is and, and there is to look at and say, so where can we go? Where should we go? Sort of lay out strategy, lay out tactics and let them go. But also yeah. to say, I'm here to get to let, help you to get the job done and not t tell you how. Really. Yeah. Well, and to be able to actually sort of show that in action, not just to like say the words, but actually do it that way. I mean, I've just, I, as you said, you know, when we talked the other day, you had just that earlier that day had to crawl around to your desk and do something. I mean, that's, yeah. that's really the definition of hands on. Yeah, well, I think it's funny. I, I was, I was out on the floor with one of the architects and then he was having a problem. It was early, very early in the morning. Nobody was here. And I said, that. let me see. And, and sort of walked back to my desk and said, hey, I still got it. But but, but to the but to the point, I think I think the other people would look at it and go, "Isn't that our, our CIO?" But I don't, you know, that's that's <laughs> yeah, right. Well, let them let them open their minds to the kind the broad range of skills that CIOs all have <laughs> these days. I want to I want to circle back and ask you to tell us more about you had mentioned um, a data product that is in the works for you at H2M, something that eventually you'll be offering it. I don't know if you offer it now to clients, you may eventually sell it. I'd say my, my antenna went up when you mentioned it earlier because we're always at CIO Magazine, we're always looking for IT driven streams of revenue. And this sounds very much like something that falls into that box. So tell us more about that, what it is, where you are in that life cycle and what, what the, um, absolute best case scenario for it yeah. would be. So that, you know, the, the, the thought process for us wasn't to develop something that, that might become saleable, if you will. Okay. But in terms of it, it, it really, that the, the data integration, if you will, the mm -hmm. aggregation of data from the various systems, but also in that the, the BIM CAD realm, this, this, that's not foreign to the folks that are using building information modeling. But mm -hmm. the idea of actually that this 
we're aggregating data, even what we're going to call the 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 appropriate pieces, if you will, of administrative data. Yes. We would call it the mark the marketing data, the proposal data, more than anything else. Some of the financials and whatnot, but looking at the 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 data that's that's created through our design for facilities management, and and being able to pull all of that together and create a you know create a uh, I'm going to say a data warehouse, but it's not that. But the application also working with potentially third party applications, uh, warehousing and uh, analytics applications all combined. So it may be you, you, in my mind, you'd be able to pull whatever third party products you need in, but, yeah. but, uh, you know, but assembling that data, tying it back to the BIM data so that for inspection purposes, for, okay. uh, maintenance purposes that an owner would be able to go and say, here's right from the initial design of this before any brick was laid for lack of a better, right? Before the foundation was laid of mm -hmm. this facility, here's the design work. We've gone through all of the, uh, the construction phases, the timeline, the budget and whatnot, and we're able to midstream and construction deliver a product, again, deliver data, if you will, to say, mm -hmm. this is where it was supposed to be. And an owner can look at it and say, well, the contractor based on the design and the plan timeline and the budget, this is where it was supposed to be at six months or 24 months. And this is where we actually are and to visualize it. That's not, and that's common in, in virtual design, construction, and operations. But okay. now, now, basically, in the in the old days, you know, in terms of just being an architectural firm, you did the design work, you worked with contractors, the building is designed, you're done. Cool. Now yeah. you've taken all of that information, put it together, even from even from proposal stages and requirement stages, you've tied that to, to the three D design, the point cloud. All of the HVAC, all of the utility systems, if you will, HVAC, all of the GIS data, and sell, selling that as a product, a data product of sorts, like I said, and again, third party applications to work with it, that when you're main, going through maintenance and you're looking, you're actually able to visualize, right? Because of our 3D design, you can look and say, uh, I'm going to oversimplify, it. but basically you're going into your, you're going into your, uh, your plant and looking and saying, oh, we've got a problem with this particular, uh, let's say water in, in our water water facility, we, mm -hmm. we got a problem with this particular pump and there's three pumps there and it's like, you're just visualizing it. The person's visualizing it. Maintenance person is looking and saying, oh, it's, I can see this. It's the one highlighted in red, it's the middle one. And again, I'm over simple point, but then sure. to actually look at that and to blow up based on manufacturer specifications to see in wow. front of them, yes. the manufacturer specifications to see the design and be able to say, oh, I'm going to open some, it's the cog. This, this is the gear or this is, Oh, this is the piece mm -hmm. of the pump that's, or this is the cable, or this right. is the, or this is the, the water line. And I know which part I need to do before I've even walked out to actually look at that, yeah. that pump. Yeah. Well, that reminds me of some of the scenes we see these days in science fiction or movies set in the future. They're always calling stuff up in the air in front of them and going into 3D. And this is essentially things that are really happening now and, right and, that, and and that's and that's correct you know you look yeah. again that's to that point you're looking at this cameras everywhere and whatnot but actually yeah. the, the 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 and this is this the, that part of it bim and reality capture were one of the things that really intrigued me about this industry yeah but looking at building design the idea really as you said that you really can pull it up in front of you and look and say okay this pump is not working properly Amazing. here's the out yeah. here's the output of it you're pulling the data from the, the pump's output and using a product that was created at design time by H2M mm -hmm. and pulling again data from the manufacturer specifications to be able to do that. And and as you said, so here it is up on the big screen in yeah. front of you. Yeah. And and I don't even have to go out there. I know what exactly. And and again, I oversimplify, but it's it is really that that possible. And that's that's our goal to look in three to five years that we're we're doing that and we're and we're facilitating that now for our own purposes. But, mm -hmm. And we believe that the data product itself will be saleable, but the aggregation of the data yeah. is something that that we feel we're developing that can be that might become saleable. Right. And again, the, the, that wasn't our goal. It wasn't right. our goal. Well, yeah, it was something you never knew you always might end up with. Exactly. You know. Right. Right. <laughs> so, but but I understand that that it's more the journey getting there will actually have so much more benefit than if you were to put a price tag on it, even at this point. 
Um, you know, I want to follow that thread a little further about emerging technologies and things that are trending in the AEC industry as a whole. I did a, a little research as we were talking about all these things over recent weeks, and we've talked about the data management, we've talked about remote work and about 3D printing and, pre and prefab buildings and stuff, but green processes also came up on this list. And I was thinking when you were talking about employees and attracting, attracting staff, especially younger professionals in the field, um, that is a big trend, the idea of uh, having a lower carbon footprint and uh, technologists who want to work in that kind of area. And you yourself have been very interested in this. I know at our last CIO 100 Innovation Conference uh, last summer, I think you mentioned that you had sat in on a presentation from the sustainableit.org yes. folks. Uh, so talk about talk about that, about green processes in your field in AEC and your own personal interests and connection with sustainability in IT. Yeah, so um, here, one of, one of the, the, the values, uh, it's, and if you walk through our halls at any H2M facility, you see our mission and values posted in many spots on the walls. And one of them is, and, and really it's sort of our, you know, the mission is, is building sustainable communities. Mm -hmm. And it's been, it's been that since I walked in the door, it's not an, yeah. it's not a new thought. It's not a new thought here. Um, it's been something that they've been talking about for many years, but that that's exactly it in terms of design work. And, and of course, because we have an environmental division and even, even our, in, in our uh, insurance and structural divisions is looking uh, you know, lead certification, if you will, and making sure that all of all aspects of of the design from construction, you know, you look at it, even the efficiency of 3D, a 3D printed building is is very efficient. It's it's very accurate. It really the accuracy of, of building is, if you will, but uh, but also just using sustainable products in that construction is is a consideration. But every aspect of uh, of the building, if you will, from lighting, from uh, you know, and again, it's a, it's a little out of school for me, but but the whole side of looking at in terms of the you know the greening, if you will, of of a roof, you know, of rooftops and things like that. Yeah. Obviously, you're speaking solar and whatnot, but even the even to the point of saying, okay, we're we're making better use of it without without solar panels or whatnot in terms of utilizing the sun or or you know deflecting the sun. And again, I, it's a little bit out of turn for me to speak about the actual construction and, and the sustainability of building, but but it is a focus for H2M and looking at that. Mm -hmm. From the standpoint of IT and sitting in on, uh, as you said, uh, a couple of uh, different different meetings with sustainableit.org, um, looking at it from the standpoint of, I took the position, there were some very, I'll say the big players that were in the room mm -hmm. and, and me from H2M being one of the smaller players, but looking at it and saying, you know, you guys and and women need to, you're, you're going to take the lead in this, but it comes down to me it, it, every, and everybody, it doesn't matter how big or small, looking at it and trying to, and making determinations in our procurement of going yeah. to to mm -hmm. the, the providers, whatever whatever it is, OEM, and and whether it's desktops or servers or whether it's network equipment, mm -hmm. um, or whether it's it, printers and, and scanners and drones, to look at and say what you you need to provide us. And I know sustainable IT is working toward this to look and say you need to tell us what the carbon print footprint is of your equipment. Yeah. Internally, we're looking at it to say how do we how do we minimize it? and 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 part of that is as simple as as cloud, right? But even looking at cloud providers and say, you need to provide us with what right. your what your goals are towards green, towards sustainability. Yes, yeah, you can't so really just kick it down the, you can't really just kick it down the road and say, oh, well, we're, we have no carbon footprint because we outsource to cloud, but then you have to go and look at, well, what are their data centers doing? Exactly, and that's exactly, yeah. and we're we're at the point, this is, this is something that, um, that, you know, here at H2M, wasn't necessarily part of the discussion, but we brought it to the forefront in the last yeah. year or so. And looking and saying our procurement will, you know, will revolve around that. We'll look at that, so, and also to the point, my um, of looking at it and saying, because some one of our contractors at some point might very well in an RFP 
say the same thing comes, right? That's That's what, you know, it's the same thing that we see in terms of cybersecurity. We're seeing it in RFPs, level 400 design or level 500 design or virtual reality, augmented reality and and sustainability looking at and saying, Mm -hmm. what's, what's H2M's carbon footprint? What, what's your, from this technology standpoint or from the overall operation standpoint of for H2M? Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, and I also wanted to mention that audience member on YouTube who sent in that wonderful question about BIM and how it's advancing, said he really appreciated the work you were doing and thanked you for your answer. So very so welcome. We've got, we've got very, thank, alert, you for the, thank you for the question. Alert audience members. And for my wrap up question, I want to talk about what you have learned about your own leadership style in these last few years. You've gone from a very different part of the industry into this whole new gig and you can't you can't seem to retire that that doesn't seem to be happening and and i i empathize with that i can't seem to figure out how to do it either um so tell me what what is it that the last few years have revealed to you about your own leadership style so I, and i think part of it revolves around whether it's the leadership style but i guess that's where it it, it evolves to the leadership style, I guess, is I've, I've been a perpetual student. I mean, I, 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 so I, I, and not to, you know, it's not to, not to, not to tout it, but I have a, I have a, a, an MBA and then I have a second master's degree and I wasn't looking for the second master's degree. I, I was, I was going to school because I enjoyed it. I was taking yeah. some classes yeah. and, and a young woman at the registrar said to me, Mr. McCaffrey, you know, if you take this class and go and take the, the uh, thesis capstone class, Mm-hmm. You'll have a degree in this, and I said, "Really?" But I continued, and I have, and I had some graduates. Yeah, yeah, and I, but I continued to take classes whenever I could, and I think, you know, for me, I, I sort of mentioned that earlier. But after forty-two years of doing this, I'm still intrigued. I'm still learning. You know, whether it's three D, mm-hmm. you know, three D, three uh, D design, building information modeling, reality capture, just even the even analytics to be able to use tools that that five years ago would have been maybe mm-hmm. out of the, out of, out of the, uh, the expense for, you know, range, the cost yeah. would have been a little high for H2M, you know, the things that we've been able to do. Yep. I'm, I'm still intrigued. I'm still learning. I still, I still, even to the point of saying, I still want to get under a desk. You know, I, I, that's like, Oh, somebody calls me and says, Hey, can you, can you help me with my PC? And I'm like, yes, yes. I hope so. Let uh, me help. Yes. Let me help. Um, <laughs> so I, you know, I think, I don't know that it, in terms of the leadership thing is that that's where it goes to, uh, it's sort of always been my approach, but it's, as we mentioned earlier, looking at it and saying, it just sort of reaffirms to me. It's like I mentioned earlier, you know, we look at people, process and technology, but it's people. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, and, and it's sort of stating the obvious, but it's people. The, mm-hmm. the process to get those people to adopt the process is something that I I feel like I've always been able to do. And, mm-hmm. and changing that model from IT as customer service to being a partnership model and looking together to where we can go. Yes. Uh, but I think... I think what it's brought to me in the last three, four years is really the, the affirmation that that still works. If you look at it and say, um, you know, we still hear the, I don't, we were looking at a project management thing recently, a tool that we use, and some, it wasn't being used uh, effectively or efficiently across the organization. And we brought people in from the outside uh, to, to do some, to, to re, reintroduce it, if you will, and, and train. And, and of course, a lot of, you get this one and it's, I can't afford to lose Joe or Mary for, for three days. And and my position has always been, you can't afford not to. We go. can't afford not mm-hmm. to. The yeah. only, we, we need to be looking. If we don't look at BIM, BIMCAD type of de- development, if we don't use Revit for every project, if we're not looking at it, we will be three years from now, somebody's going to look past us or we're not going to be able to respond to the RFP. Right. right. So I know it's a long answer to the question, but my thing is it's sort of a reaffirmation that, it's about people and you connect with people and you, if you can show them, you know, whether it's the IT folks or whether it's the partners out there, that mm-hmm. if you, you can show them the value of, of what you're doing or the attempts, some of the things that they seem are constraints because IT, you know, security yeah. constraints and whatnot is even just, you know, speaking to them in, 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 you know, in terms that they understand is why this is essential, why this is necessary. Right. Why right. is it essential to go down this road? Mm-hmm. Um, I think, if if there's anything to to summarize, anything I've learned is that the 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 path went pretty well, and then that whether I'm working with a staff of nine or working with a staff of 150, 
that mm-hmm. if you can reach them, if you can be a mentor, if you can tell them, hey, what we do here, what we do here at work is so that we can do what we want to do out there in life. Mm-hmm. And and they, th- there is a work-life balance. I just look at it and say, this is we do it here so we can do that there. And and it can be effective and it can be work for you. That's yeah. that's that's my long answer to the very short question. <laughs> no, that's okay. Absolutely. It's it's a little hard. I don't know what I'd say if someone asked me to sum up my leadership strategy as yeah. well. Um, thank you very much, John. This has really been a, a fascinating conversation. And thanks again to our audience members. We wish more of you would send in questions, but it's okay. We'll take one great question yeah. uh, from the audience and be happy with that. And I've really appreciated having you here today. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Mary Fran. I, I appreciate it. I'm glad to be part of it. Good, good. Thank you. If you joined us a little late today and you're kicking yourself that you didn't see this whole interview, don't worry. You can see it later on today on CIO.com. And of course, on our YouTube, our CIO channel on YouTube. CIO Leadership Live is also available as an audio podcast wherever you find your podcasts. And I hope that you tuned in and enjoyed the conversation today with CIO John McCaffrey of H2M Architects and Engineers, and that you will plan to tune in again for our next Leadership Live, which will be on Wednesday, February 7th, when I will have uh, CIO Faraz Murchia of Glendale, Arizona on the show. And if Glendale, Arizona is sparking a little thing in your head where you're saying, where have I heard that before? That is the city that is hosting this year's Super Bowl. So the five days before Super Bowl Sunday, we will be talking with the CIO who's pretty much at ground zero for all that is going on around that big event right now or in February. Thank you again for joining us. Do take a minute to subscribe to our YouTube channel because you don't want to miss any other ones of these Leadership Lives and you'll find all the previous episodes on the YouTube channel. Thanks again for joining us today. Stay well and we'll see you here next time.